Shabbat Shalom. Tonight we celebrate Rabbi Stephen Wise. We began a Founders Day celebration last year as a way of honoring Rabbi Wise, Rabbi Zeldin, our founding families, some of whom are here this evening, and other key staff and lay leaders who really helped to build our synagogue and our schools. Rabbi Hersher, Matuka Benjamin, Cantor Lamb, other members of our staff, some here this evening who've been with us for decades. Who was Rabbi Stephen S. Wise? He was born in Budapest on March 17th, 1874, and according to one tradition, he was quite proud to be born on St. Patrick's Day, and he was known for signing letters and important documents in green ink. And I've seen some of those letters, I know it's true. His father was also a rabbi. In fact, he came from a long, long, long line of rabbis. His dad was Aaron Weiss, and his grandfather was the chief rabbi of Hungary, Rabbi Joseph Weiss. His father took the family to America in 1875 and served as rabbi of Rod of Sholem in New York City. Stephen was one of seven children of Aaron and Sabine Wise. He was raised in New York. He studied Latin and Greek at Columbia University. When he graduated in 1892, he went to Vienna to study to become a rabbi. And then when he returned to the United States a few years later, he served as assistant rabbi at Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in New York, which uh, was and is a conservative synagogue. The senior rabbi at B'nai Jeshurun, Rabbi Henry Jacobs, died quite suddenly, and Rabbi Wise was elected his successor at a very young age. And before being given the job, he was asked to deliver a trial sermon by the board of directors. And one of the trustees protested to the president of the synagogue that the sermon was so fine, it was so excellent, that he thought it must have been written by Rabbi Wise's father, who was quite an established rabbi, and had merely been delivered by Rabbi Stephen Wise. And the president of the congregation replied, according to Stephen, that if their young rabbi had sense enough to preach one of his father's good sermons instead of one of his own bad sermons, this only proved how fit he was to be their rabbi. Now, during his time as senior rabbi at B'nai Jeshurun, four events occurred in Stephen Wise's life that affected the rest of his rabbinate and, in fact, shaped the Jewish future and, and touched our lives as well. The first event during that period was the death of his father, uh, who died in, on Passover of 1897. And suddenly, at age 23, Stephen Wise became, almost overnight, not just the patriarch of the family, but the main breadwinner. The second event was a terrible wave of pogroms in Russia, along with the Dreyfus trial in France. And these events shaped the very course of his rabbinate. The third event was his connection and later friendship with Theodore Herzl and his involvement in the modern Zionist movement. Rabbi Wise met Herzl in 1897, and then he attended the Second Zionist Congress in Switzerland the following year, and they became friends. Of course, Herzl died not too many years thereafter, but Wise's lifelong leadership in the Zionist movement really began during this period. And finally, during this same period, Rabbi Wise met Louise Waterman, who would later become his wife, and together they would raise two children and remained married until Louise died in 1947. A few years after becoming the senior rabbi at Congregation B'nai Jeshurun, Rabbi Wise and his family moved to Portland, which at the time was thought to be a very strange career move. He was in the center of the Jewish world in Manhattan, and he left to go to Portland out in the west in the middle of nowhere. But that's where his children were born, and it was very important, that period in his life. That's where he started to get involved in a variety of political causes, including especially child labor issues 
at that time in Oregon, uh, small children were permitted to work. There were no child labor laws. Uh, he actually became a labor commissioner in Oregon and helped pass legislation outlawing child labor during that period. He also got very involved in issues of racial inequality and tried to make a difference there. In 1906, Rabbi Wise moved back to New York and he founded what became known as the Free Synagogue. And of course, when we Jews hear about a free synagogue, we get very excited. We think it means uh, no dues, but, <clears throat> but it doesn't actually mean that. It, uh, it meant free seating. People could sit anywhere they wanted to sit. There were no reserved pews. Some of you remember um, the, uh, the way it once was where you would, your family would pay for a pew up front, and that was where you sat. And if you didn't have a lot of money, you sat in the back. And Rabbi Wise didn't like that at all. So he was for free seat seating. But the most important thing for him when it came to the free synagogue was freedom of the pulpit. That was a core value for him. No board of directors would limit what he may or may not say from the bima. And this continues, whether you, whether you like it or not, to be a core value of our congregation to this day. And it was one of the reasons that Rabbi Zeldin wanted to call the synagogue uh, after his teacher because of that same bedrock core principle of freedom of the pulpit. Wise was active, as I mentioned, during his entire career in the Zionist cause, which was not um, typical for liberal rabbis, reform rabbis especially, of his era, but he was really a leader in that, uh, in that uh, movement. He was a vociferous and early critic of the Nazi regime. Rabbi Wise was a co-founder of the NAACP in 1914 and was a lifelong advocate for full inclusion and equal rights for people of color. In 1922, Rabbi Wise founded the Jewish Institute of Religion, which trained rabbis and then later merged with the Hebrew Union College. At, at the time, HUC and the Reform Movement was not Zionist, and so part of the reason that he wanted to create his own liberal seminary is he wanted a liberal seminary that was Zionist as well. Um, he also was a founder of the American Jewish Congress. He had a very close relationship with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and came before him quite regularly on behalf of issues affecting the Jewish people, matters of justice, and the Zionist cause. Later, he was criticized for perhaps not being forceful enough. Uh, his defenders would say that the, uh, the power of the American Jewish community at that time is not comparable to what it is today, um, and he had, to, uh, he had to be rather humble in his approach to the president. And he was very famous for his preaching. He was known to be a fantastic orator. I'm going to show you a brief clip, and you'll get a chance to see why, um, a little bit of, of a sense of Rabbi Wise's speaking style. This clip that you're going to see was filmed uh, on March 27, 1933, at Madison Square Garden. And uh, there's just a few of these clips that, that I was able to find online. This one, I think, is uh, really special. You get to see his passion. And um, it's not hard to imagine what he must have been feeling and going through at this rally. Um, you can uh, see in the front, uh, uh, Mayor LaGuardia was sitting there, and there were other leaders of New York City at that time. Let's just take a moment and hear Rabbi Weiss in his own voice. I thank God for these human guardians, defenders, of civilization are not silent because they are not afraid. I thank God for them with their help and under God we shall live and survive and Hitlerism will become a hideous and tragic memory and nothing more. You get a sense of his passion. You get a sense of what he stood for. Uh, tragically, of course, um, those words in 1933, his, his hope that Hitlerism would become, um, would, would be forgotten, um, were uh, not prophetic. Uh, the following words were written by Florence Selden, uh, blessed memory. You think, she wrote, 
This temple started in 1964. Let me tell you that it actually started long before that. In the year 1933, the United States faced the worst depression in its history. That same year, Europe faced the beginning of the worst oppression in its history, and the Jewish people faced the worst devastation in its history. In New York City, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise spearheaded a protest march. The purpose of the march was to call to the attention of the public the great dangers in our universe. Among the thousands of people who joined him on that cold, blustering day was a child, barely 13 years old. He heard the thunderous voice as though it came from on high. Standing back in the crowd, he was able to see a man who appeared to him to be nine feet tall. While government officials paid little heed to his warnings of impending doom in Europe, and while Great Britain turned a deaf ear to his pleas to open the gates of Palestine to the millions of Jews who would have to leave Europe in the near future, the young boy, whose name was Isaiah Zeldin, heard and heeded, and his life was changed. He left that protest meeting vowing to dedicate his life to helping his people. On that day in 1933, Stephen Wise accomplished much more than he realized. He channeled the direction which the young boy would follow the rest of his life. Rabbi Wise, in an autobiography that he published just a few months before he died in 1949, wrote about his passion for politics. And he wrote about how it connected to his vision of his rabbinate, the pulpit. Religion, he wrote, is a vision or an ideal of life. Politics is a method or modus vivendi. To say that the minister should not go into politics is to imply that ideal and reality are twain and alien. Politics is what it is because too often religion stays out of it. For wise, the supreme declaration of the Hebrew Bible was and remains, he wrote, justice, justice, shall thou pursue, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. And then he continues, whether it be easy or hard, whether it be justice for white or black, for Jew or Christian. And he wrote about, in this same essay, his connection to the NAACP, his involvement as a founder of the NAACP. He wrote, soon after my return from Oregon to New York, I joined that fine group of men who founded the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, so as to cast my lot with those determined to fight against injustice to Negroes. In those days, one found prejudice and sanctimonious justification of injustice to Negroes on all sides. I can still recall the campaign of a Southern, and then he put this in quotes, statesman, for the office of United States Senator, his platform being the observance of the golden rule and subjugation of the Negro. Was ever, Rabbi Wise wrote, such miscegenation known before as the attempt to unite the observance of the golden rule and the subjugation of the Negro? I shudder to think of what our temple's namesake would say about this year's presidential election campaign. <laughs> As a man who believed that politics ultimately should serve religion and its goal, religion's goal, of achieving the ideal, wise would no doubt be disappointed in the coarse nature of the current political climate. He would caution us never to let our passion for justice prevent us from behaving with respect and dignity in our political or religious conversations. And I think he would urge us to use our voices in the pursuit of justice, whether it be, as he wrote, easy or hard, whether it be justice to white or black, Jew or Christian, and I think he would add, or Muslim too, legal or illegal immigrant, straight, or gay. May his legacy inspire us, as it did our founder, Rabbi Isaiah Zeldin. And may his courage 
and his vision help us to live up to the highest ideals of our people and our heritage. And if we are blessed to be able to see farther, to have the courage to live up to our highest ideals, it will be in large part not because of our own great strength, not because of our own great vision, but because we are standing on the shoulders of our founders, our rabbis, our pioneers, our visionary leaders. Shabbat Shalom.